Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this press conference. My name is Jessica Gable, and I am the West Coast Media Relations Officer for Food and Water Watch, and also a member of the Last Chance Alliance. I'll be facilitating today's event and introducing our remarkable speakers today. While a Dixie fire takes its place as the worst single source wildfire the state has ever seen, we know it will likely not be the worst we will ever see. And we know that this fire's devastation is only a preview of climate, change in, climate change's inevitable conclusion if we don't address fossil fuel extraction and infrastructure and their connection to climate change. The International Panel on Climate Change's most recent report makes the need for action abundantly clear. Temperatures will rise beyond the tipping point of 1.5 degrees Celsius in nine years if we do nothing. That means an immediate end to fracking an immediate end to oil drilling, and the immediate implementation of 2,500 foot setbacks between drill sites and communities. The Last Chance Alliance has been advocating for these imperative changes for years, and now the time has run out. Governor Newsom has made moves to deny fracking permits, and this should be just the beginning of his bold climate action. California's frontline communities are already battling a climate crisis that is also a public health crisis. To protect them, we need to immediately phase out fossil fuel drilling and infrastructure. Before we get started with the rest of our press conference, I would like to introduce our next speaker for a land acknowledgement. Singer, songwriter, MC, poet, and author Jessa Calderon is of the Chumash and Tongva nations of Southern California. Jessa works for Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples, which is a member of the Last Chance Alliance. As an MC, poet, and author, Jessa is able to share her culture and truth and brings her listeners enlightenment and healing. Since 2019, Jessa has joined the Dream Warriors Collective, which works through art to heal community. Thank you so much. Um, hello, my relatives. Uh, before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that this um, devastating fire has taken place on on native land. And so I'm going to name some of the nations that have been devastated on these ancestral lands of the Mountain Maidu, the Konkao Maidu, the Pitt River peoples, and the Matukta peoples. And I mentioned this to bring the understanding that these are some of the nations, and it is all of the nations of California who need to be in talks of, you know, how this conversation takes place, what happens, because these are the peoples who have the ancestral knowledge. They are the ones who know how to take care of the land. They have always known how to take care of the land. And it is time that their knowledge comes to the forefront and that they are able to practice their cultural ways and traditions that have been utilized from time immemorial to keep this California land a paradise which in today's society of devastation has kept us from practicing our ways. So I acknowledge these nations whose ancestral lands um, this particular fire is happening and, and I urge you all to keep that in your heart and your mind that these are the people who need to have their voices heard on how to prevent these types of devastations to further occur. Awesh Koneha, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jessa. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce Cesar Aguirre who is a community organizer with CCEJN. Thank you, Cesar. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Cesar Aguirre and I'm a community organizer with the Central California Environmental Justice Network where we work in uh, environmental justice communities throughout the Central Valley, uh, whether it's with farm workers or people that have toxic polluters like oil and gas sites in their backyards, near their schools, near their clinics as is the norm here in Kern County. Um, we're here to talk about the climate crisis and the effects of it. And the main contributor to that has been the burning of fossil fuels. The IPCC report that came out um, a few days ago shows us that humans are the main contributor to this climate crisis that we find ourselves in. And nature itself can tell us this story as well. Ice core samples show us that when we started burning fossil fuels at the beginning of the industrial revolution, is when we put ourselves on this path towards the climate crisis where we've caused this irreversible damage to the climate. And that irreversible damage is something that was found in a 1982 report done by Exxon. They knew that the unrestricted use 
and uh, um, putting carbon into the air would be dangerous to the climate, uh, and it would be dangerous to the health of the environment, yet they, they continue to do it. And the fact that they continue to do it is the reason that we find ourselves here today. They put it in our neighborhoods, and we know that they do that. We know that we are targeted, especially frontline communities. There are reports like the Sorrell report that came out of Kettleman City in Kern County that shows that putting uh, toxic sites, putting contaminators where communities may not have the most political clout is much more beneficial to them because they'll come into much less regulatory scrutiny and there'll be much less complaints about uh, their operations. The reason they do this, the reason they target our neighborhoods is because they don't want to be responsible. They want to be able to get away with as much as they can. And people are fed up. It comes down to a lack of respect for our lives. There's people that are working across the world and especially here in the state of California to make sure we combat these things. Like a group of people from uh, Nelson Court, which is a neighborhood in Arvin, a very small town here in Kern County that has a lot of oil within the neighborhoods. A few of them were evacuated due to a gas leak and they became citizen scientists. They took air samples and found out that when the gas leak was happening and even years afterwards, there was toxic levels of things that are, affect public health like formaldehyde and benzene, but also incredibly high levels of this climate crisis causing greenhouse gases like methane and other things. These are the things that cause the heat waves that put us into the drought that we're in. Heat waves that cause more intense wildfires that we'll hear people later on that have been very directly affected by them. And it spreads out, um, the effects of these wildfires spreads throughout California. Farm workers here in Kern County uh, have to work when the smoke is very thick and they have to breathe in that smoke. And I know from our direct work with farm workers that many of them are not getting the masks that they should be getting by law to protect themselves. At the end of the day, it comes down to lack of respect for the people that live and work in this community. Uh, and we can't depend our on our local officials to do anything about it. As a matter of fact, Kern County is suing the state because they feel they're taking too much action against oil and gas. This shows us that our local officials are still willing to put us in sacrifice zones. They're still willing to make sure that profit is over people. Their unwillingness to diversify to the economy to become a leader in this uh, new renewable energy future shows us that California is also okay with using Kern County as a sacrifice zone and use us as a stepping stool onto the future. We're, we don't want that. We don't need that. We need action. Kern County has some of the most carbon intense oil in all in the whole world. It's very heavy and they have to use very, very powerful processes in order to get it out. These processes like steam injection have caused things like the Simric oil spill that was discovered in 2019. And when it was discovered, it was around a million, uh, a million barrels that had been leaked. But through an investigation, it comes to light that that spill had been going on since 2003, a 16 year spill with over 82 million gallons spilled. They did that because they could get away with it. And they realized that they could just pay a small fine and it would not be as much as the benefits that they got from breaking the law for 16 years. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to a lack of respect for community. The system is working as intended, putting minority communities in, in the front lines to take the damage. But now that, that this has spilled into a global issue, we have to address the problem where it started. There should be no new permits for any oil and gas operations within 2,500 2, feet uh, where, of where people live. There has to be a moratorium passed to protect Californians. There is a path forward, but we have to run and not walk. The irreversible damage has been made and it's up to us to make sure we mitigate the effects of what has already been done. Thank you. Cesar, thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you for your work with the vulnerable communities in Kern. And thank you again for reminding us that it is time to run and not walk. Our next speaker is a community member of Greenville. Margaret Alicia Garcia is a journalist and teaching artist based in Greenville. And she comes to us today um, 
in a time when Greenville is undergoing a very, very difficult time. So I would like to thank her especially for taking the time to share her story with us now. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. Um, as I've been asked questions this last week, uh, many people have started the story with uh, what happened to your town this week on August 4th. But the story goes back 30 days um, for us. We were originally evacuated on, I believe, uh, July 17th. Um, Indian Valley was evacuated for 11 days. And our area is highly uh, agricultural. Um, there's lots of people with many animals. Um, there's ranchers in some area. There's people who don't drive in our area. Um, there's people who haven't left Greenville in maybe a decade. And as the Dixie Fire was taking hold in the canyon, so many communities in our area were immediately um, affected and evacuated. Normally what happens in Plumas County when there is a fire is it's one community and that community is able to get to safety to a different community in our small uh, county. Um, that's not what happened this time. Um, we had all of the canyon evacuated. So the small communities of Twain and Rich Bar and Rush Creek. And then we had Indian Falls evacuated, Greenville evacuated, Taylorsville evacuated. And all these people were going to Quincy or Chester. Uh, my ex-husband and his girlfriend, for example, um, he's in Crescent Mills, he was evacuated. He went to her place in Chester. Chester was evacuated. They left to friends in Westwood. Westwood was evacuated. They left to Susanville. Susanville was evacuated. And they finally went all the way up to Cedarville in order to be out of the way of fire. Um, this has made our community uh, anxious, exhausted, anxiety ridden. Um, and I frankly don't know how we recover from this. We're an area, um, uh, median income is under 30,000. We have a lot of retirees. We have a lot of people whose um, uh, home insurance, their fire insurance was canceled during the Paradise Fire, um, because which was is about an hour, Paradise is about an hour down the canyon from us. Um, so we have a uh, little recourse right now as to what to do. Um, and so that's the first part of the setup is not August 4th, but everything beforehand. Um, I witnessed in, I've been up there 19 years and I, somebody um, called my attention the other day to a Twitter post I had put up in June that talked about how dry it was then. We experienced three weeks of 105 degree weather um, in an area where in the summers, when I moved there, it maybe got to 85. Um, maybe I remember recording like 93 degrees a couple of times um, between 2000 and 2010. And uh, we've never seen it over a hundred and three weeks of 105 degree weather really did us in. Um, it's hot, it's dry. Uh, the Feather River was at the point in June when I um, recorded that. Um, it was at the levels we usually see in September. Um, I drove down to Southern California and I was able to go past Round Valley Lake, which is up by my house, and then uh, Lake Oroville Dam. And it was depressing and also um, it just really was waiting for disaster to happen. Um, to see the, the reservoir that low. Uh, we are now hearing reports from people um, in Greenville, people who work for the water district and others who haven't officially come on board um, with uh, official statements, but um, that we lost uh, water pressure in Greenville right before the fire took Greenville. That's how 
um, that's where our water was going. Uh, in the week before the fire, we had all these notices being sent out from the local community services district about trying not to use water as much as possible, knowing that um, the water pressure was low and that the water itself was low. And we had never experienced anything like that. Um, so the fire took about two thirds of Greenville. We don't have a post office anymore. Library hardware store that was there 91 years is gone. Um, most of downtown Greenville was built out of wood. Um, my office building was built in 1860. Um, most of the downtown was built before 1890. Uh, it's all gone. We're, we are stuck with buildings we never liked in the first place. Uh, somebody put a concrete office building up about five years ago. That's there in the Dollar General that most of us fought to keep out of our area is still there. Um, it's, it's widespread devastation and um, we are evacuated to Quincy, Reno, Chico, the Bay Area, Southern California, um, and all very anxious to get back and see what's left. Um, last thing I really want to say is uh, we, we are grateful for the firefighters. We are grateful that there are people uh, willing to come in, but at the same time, we keep asking questions to ourselves about how come our fire had only 5,600 people and other fires had more. Um, people in Greenville and granted we are an odd mix of uh, um, there are some uh, big conservatives up there with a lot of conspiracy theories and um, right now the narrative as stands is that um, they let Greenville burn they never would have done this to Lake Almanor or Chester because they're more affluent areas um, and it's hard to combat that sort of narrative when that's what it looks like on, on the surface. Uh, there are people right now in Taylorsville who are refusing to leave. And the narrative in the broader media is that, you know, these are obstinate uh, gun toting people and they're, you know, making it hard to fight the fire. Taylorsville is standing because people stayed and are watering it down because they're already afraid that no entity is going to help them. Um, I'm thank you guys for um, having me as part of this to tell um, the stories coming out of, of Greenville this morning. And I'll, I'll be happy to take questions later. Thank you very much, Margaret. We really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of this and to share your story. And I think you definitely have made it so clear just how devastating this fire is for not just Greenville, but for the surrounding areas. And because of climate change that is fueled by the extraction of fossil fuels, this is very likely not to be the last time this happens, which is a truly horrifying thought. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mary Rose Tarouk. Mary Rose has been organizing with environmental justice communities for 25 years and is currently the coordinator of the Reclaim Our Power Utility Justice Campaign. Welcome, Mary Rose. Uh, thank you, Jessica and, um, and Margaret. Uh, we send our, our love to you all. And the reason why Reclaim Our Power Utility Justice Campaign exists is that uh, we are going to fight this. <laughs> Uh, these fires, especially fires that are caused by big utilities, private utilities like Pacific Gas and Electric, that we're not going to uh, stand um, for this kind of destruction from fossil fuel companies, um, and that we're going to organize the hell out of our communities to create a new reality that will serve the needs of our children our, our families to be intact through the climate crisis that we know is happening now and that, that global scientists are saying will happen uh, 
that there's more to happen um, through the IPCC report. So the Reclaim Our Power campaign is campaigning for a new energy system, one that meets our community needs under all this climate disruption that we are seeing now and into the future. Our target is Pacific Gas and Electric. That private corporate model of centralized utility uh, <laughs> of massive transmission lines running across our state and native lands are not the future uh, that we, is not the future that we need for the utility system uh, of the 21st century. We need to move away from these investor owned utility models like PG&E uh, who have caused many fires, including very likely the Dixie fire uh, and then also their equipment that is failing uh, under the fly fire that merged with the Dixie fire that is now the biggest in California history. And so all that merging is the responsibility, all that merging of the, these large wildfires, knowing that the conditions are dry out there in our forests, in our, in our small towns, out in the, in the rural parts of California, that we need a utility that, that can see exactly what's happening now and through climate change and be able to uh, uh, design a utility system that can withstand or avoid those kinds of uh, mistakes and fatal flaws like the fire that's burning now um, uh, in the Northern part of California. But here we are again under the, the the negligence um, of, of this murderous corporation, PG&E, um, who caused the campfire just a couple years ago that burned down paradise and killed 84 people and thousands and thousands of our forests and buildings and, and native land. And they were actually, PG&E went through bankruptcy last year um, for, for causing that fire, but the, <laughs> The, the powers that be allowed them to exit bankruptcy. And there is an enhanced oversight process where uh, ultimately PG&E, PG&E's operating license can get revoked by our state regulatory agency, the California Public Utilities Commission. So they do have that power now. And, and the Reclaim Our Power campaign has, uh, is demanding now that under the Dixie fire, that this investigation happens, that we, uh, put PG&E into that higher step of accountability and oversight, and let's let's <laughs> let's act now and not a year from now or two years from now, waiting for information because we actually have the ability to operate a different utility. And so, um, with the Last Chance Alliance, we are clearly seeing the fossil fuel industry. Uh, collapsing, and we see it collapsing as how PG&E and the, the old power lines that they have, that they have avoided um, investing in, in fixing because they are much more interested in paying their corporate shareholders who during the pandemic made an extra million to like $9 million on top of their regular million dollar payment. Um, during the pandemic. And so we know where the money is going. It's going to their corporate shareholders instead of the a safer uh, electricity system that we need. And we can't have that. So uh, Reclaim Our Power, especially around the Dixie Fire, has, uh, has demanded for three things, that we escalate the, the, uh, the accountability of PG&E to put them in, there's a six-step oversight process. We think PG&E should at least be in step four or step five of that process. And step six is ultimately revoking PG&E's operating license. We want to make sure that the wildfire safety certificate that PG&E has right now also gets pulled back because they obviously <laughs> cannot uh, guarantee our safety as it comes to these wildfires. And then the other fires that PG&E caused, uh, the Kincaid fire in 2019, the, the, the Zog fire in 2020, we want the investigations from those fires to be disclosed so that we can learn more about how to prevent these fires from happening again. Um, and I can, I can talk all, 
you know, I can be angry and spew at you uh, why PG&E is horrible. But what I also want to do is is tell you that there, you know, that there are these community solutions that we have been working on and are foundational to the new energy system that we have. It's not like we just dreamed it up. We've been working on these for decades. Environmental justice groups, fire survivor groups um, who have had to, to plan for recovery and mutual aid, disability justice groups who, um, who have so much love and care for each other, um, especially as they, they plan through um, the power shutoffs that PG&E uh, has, has, uh, has enacted and is planning to do more of in, in the following, um, you know, in, in this fire season, as well as young people who don't want to live under this apocalyptic future that we are seeing the IPCC report um, uh, talk about. And so just, just three things um, about solutions. We don't have to be afraid of fire. There's actually indigenous fire practices um, around prescribed burns and cultural fire that we can learn from uh, native folks who are already, who have been doing that, but have been prevented from doing that because our forestry management system is Eurocentric. So let's, let's so much of our, of our climate justice answers lie on, rely on, the, the indigenous knowledge of those who come from this land, the Ohlone, the Maidu, the Pitt River, um, uh, the Miwok, that there's so much to learn there. Two, we need to decentralize our energy system. And so much of that is already happening in California where we put rooftop solar um, on, our, you know, on our properties. Um, and instead of this centralized model, model from PG&E where so many uh, thousands of transmission lines are, 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 getting, uh, are getting set on fire. And then the last one is that the resilience hubs that include um, energy microgrids so that we can control our own um, energy system is part of the solutions that I love and that we wanna see more of as, uh, as we see the reports, as we see the fires, that we have the solutions for our community now. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Rose. We really appreciate your perspective and reminding us of how important community power is. So I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Sarah Brown Blake. Sarah is a registered nurse and an assistant professor at California State University Chico School of Nursing. Her clinical background is in community and public health nursing, and she is an active member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, thank, thank you, Jessica, and good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, particularly among us, this group of um, exceptional panel, panelists. I was uh, talking to one of my nurse, um, very well-respected uh, nurse colleagues who equated the Dixie Fire as, as an alarm. And nurses are no strangers to alarms. Um, we, we use them um, in the clinical setting, um, in the acute care setting um, to monitor uh, the health status of our patients, respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, um, using science-based objective measures of health and well-being in order to um, recoup and sort of rehabilitate our patients so we can send them home. Um, and we manage those signs and symptoms in addition to monitors with alarms going off um, in a variety of other ways. Um, but we want to intervene and adjust their care and improve their, their health. And so what really concerns uh, health professionals um, uh, about the immediate impact of wildfires is uh, California already has some of the worst air pollution in the country. And we know that the short term increase in particulate matter and toxins from burned structures um, really exa exas exacerbate illnesses um, like childhood asthma, which is always already um, a, a crisis in, in this state um, as it is, um, and exacerbates uh, respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular disease, um, rising uh, emergency department visits and, and um, impacts hospitalizations. Um, and we're really, also concerned about the long-term impacts, certainly in, um, in my own, in our, 
Butte County and in the surrounding counties, we've seen um, the long-term health outcomes. Um, we, kn we know that the science, um, it, it, there's a, a correlation with cancer, lung disease, heart conditions, um, and increased episodes of psychiatric and mental health events um, related to that, that trauma um, and the anxiety. Um, and so we've certainly seen that um, as a result of, of the campfire um, now coming upon our the third year um, anniversary. Um, and so the, the long journey to healing that takes place in these communities um, directly, if affected by the fires, the, ro the road to recovery takes, takes years. Um, and it's important because once the media is no longer focused on these issues, um, communities feel forgotten. Um, and we need to continue to, to work with them and support them and partner with them um, to heal. Um, and, and this has resulted in our own um, community in, in Chico and surrounding areas um, in homelessness um, and uh, family and um, cultural disruption, um, which, which can have long-term negative health impacts. Um, these communities uh, suffer for, for a much longer um, than just the immediate um, trauma of, of wildfires. So I, so I don't work in an acute care setting anymore, no more bells and whistles and alarms. Um, I'm a public health professional and that's about prevention and harm reduction um, and looking at um, places to intervene um, and impact uh, communities um, and to, to prevent uh, these long-term health um, challenges. And I work with my students and um, we look at root causes of disease um, and public health issues. Um, and we know um, this is already grounded in science. The IPCC report is clear. It, it's confirming what we already know to be true. Um, and that is that this record heat and severe drought um, is a result of a changing climate. Um, and then that root cause um, is an increasing greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Um, and this is where we need to continue to focus our efforts, not just on um, healing um, and, and making sure that our communities are safe um, and recovering quickly um, and in the long term, but, but also advocating um, for our communities um, and making sure uh, that we need to stop drilling. Um, the Dixie Fire is an alarm going off and the, and the response is, is really way too late. Um, and so nurses and healthcare professionals um, need to focus on supporting policy um, that, that contains um, and prevents uh, loss of life um, in the immediate, um, in the, in, in the immediate, but also um, long-term preventing, protecting human health um, and supporting just transitions for communities that rely on, on these industries. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for just drawing that connection between the climate crisis, which is also a public health crisis. Thank you so much for your perspective. Our next speaker is Mary Kay Benson. Mary Kay is retired from being an administrative manager for nonprofits and volunteers as a community activist working on solutions and environment. Managing Chico 350 and 350 Butte County since 2017 and now volunteers for shelter crisis solutions with North State Shelter Team and the Butte County Shelter for All Coalition. She is currently employed with Butte County Local Food Network as an assistant researcher and writer for Baseline Food Security Assessment. Welcome, Mary Kay. Thank you. Mary Kay, I think we're having a hard time hearing you. I think we might have just lost Mary Kay. So let's come back to Mary Kay in that case. We've, and had, we've had four climate accelerated disasters and uh, starting with the Oroville 
dam breaking in 2017, which sent 188,000 people scurrying for their lives with just two hours warning. And uh, the Oroville Dam is back in the news again because it's at 24% capacity. This is the drinking water uh, for most of the Bay Area and south of us. Uh, so it affects millions of people's drinking water. And also because the water level at or So it looks like we might have just lost Mary Kay. Um, while we try to get Mary Kay back on the line, why don't we go ahead and move forward with our next panelist, R.L. Miller. R.L., are you, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. All right, this is R.L. Miller with Climate Hawks Vote. Thanks so much for inviting me here. Um, so my name is R.L. Miller. I am the founder of Climate Hawks Vote. Um, I'm also a member of the Democratic National Committee. And two, two and a half years ago, I became a wildfire survivor. While the rest of America on the Democratic side was celebrating the big blue wave of that prior Tuesday, on Thursday, I was watching dark clouds form above, above my house, watching carefully for something called the Hill Fire, which turned out to be a nothing burger, and then something called the Woolsey Fire. I learned on Twitter that it might hit my community in a few hours. I went to my mother at, at that point, age 94, who needed a walker, took a lot of pills, in other words, would be a difficult person to evacuate. And I told her, just in case, please pack an overnight bag. Um, I then found out via Twitter that the fire would hit my community in two hours. I decided that I was not gonna wait for two hours to roll around, got my mother and my dog in the car and took off to my boyfriend's home where I watched my son's childhood memories burn on national television our soccer fields, the place where we organize birthday parties, our hiking trails, um, their preschool, the little cottage in the mountains where I got married, all of it burned to the ground while our so-called president was telling us that we needed to clean up our forests. It was traumatic and it is still difficult for me to speak about this without getting choked up. Um, I then, as an political organizer, tried to organize through my pain. And I began asking people in large crowds, Californians from all over the state, how many people had been affected. And I first asked who had been affected, who here was from paradise. And nobody said yes, because paradise was one dot on a map. And then I asked who here has been directly affected by any of the wildfires. And I named them all, or some of them, the Cedar Fire down in San Diego County, the Yosemite Fire, the Thomas Fire that burned my Ventura County just a couple of years ago, the Sonoma County Wine Country fires, this fire, that fire. And everywhere that I have done this consistently, a third of the hand of the room, of the hands in the room go up. And then I ask people very simply, who here knows somebody who's been directly affected by any of the wildfires? And everybody raises their hand because everybody knows somebody. And so my message to all of California is that if this fire isn't coming for you, if you're sitting at home safe in a Southern California suburb and watching the Dixie fire far away, the Bobcat fire will be coming for you next. We are all in this together. Everybody in California is going to be hit by these fires or taking in a wildfire refugee as Margaret has previously um, outlined in far too much detail. I've taken in wildfire refugees 
I've been a wildfire refugee. We're all going to become one of them sooner or later. And so while California has a reputation as a national climate leader, we are also very much on the front lines of climate change. And that means we need to do more. We need to do more than what the rest of the country is doing. We've already taken steps to implement 100% renewable energy standard. We need to stop producing oil in the state. We need to turn off the oil spigot, find a just transition for the workers who are being directly affected, find better jobs for them, um, and simply put wind down fossil fuel production in California. I'm sorry if I get choked up by, the, by this. It is still difficult for me to talk about. Every October when the winds blow, I become a nervous wreck. I'm like the, the cat on the hot tin roof. And this year it started very early. It started in June and I've been a nervous wreck and it's not going to get better until the rains come, if the rains come. Thank you for listening. Arl, thank you so much for sharing your story. And there is never any need to apologize. These are powerful memories that you're sharing with us that should be shared. And you are right, the time is up. We must act now. California has an opportunity to be a climate leader. So let's take that. Let's see if Mary Kay is back online. Mary Kay, can you can you join? Can you join us now? Yes, thank you. Sorry that up in the, the rural counties, we uh, sometimes don't have great internet. Um, so I was saying that Butte County is in Northern California. I live in Chico, which did not burn down, but we're surrounded by all of the communities that did. And it wasn't just paradise. I wanna point out that there were five communities that were decimated in the 2018 fire. But before that, we, we've we had four climate accelerated disasters in our county in the last four years, starting with the Oroville Dam collapse in 2017, which sent 188,000 people scurrying for their lives with two hours of uh, warning. And now the Oroville Dam is back in the news because it's at the lowest water capacity in its history. It's 20 for, 4% capacity. This is the drinking water for millions of people south of us. So it's really important. And because of the low water, the hydroelectric uh, facility that produced electricity had to be taken offline last week for the first time in its history. So, uh, and, then, and then 2018, the campfire, it took at least 86 people's lives. It says, Everyone says 84 now because PG&E pled guilty to 84 counts of manslaughter, but it was at least 86 people who died. And most of them were seniors. Uh, most of them uh, lived in uh, the paradise and low income areas where the low income housing was available and now gone. 15,000 homes were destroyed uh, between the Camp Fire in 2018 and the Bear Fire. North Complex fire uh, where we lost 14 more people. So that's a hundred people were killed here, uh, I say by the serial killer PG&E. But uh, the, the people um, are still traumatized right now with the Greenville fire and our, our, our hearts go out to all the folks who are going through now what we've already been through. Um, and PG&E caused all these fires. So, you know, the equipment here for our campfire was not, it was 99 years old, the tower that, that burned, and it had not been inspected for 17 years. And now with the bear fire, uh, uh, once again, PG&E thinks they probably caused it, and uh, we think so too. And it took nine hours from the first fuse blown report for someone to get up that steep terrain in exactly the same place where the campfire um, struck, which is Polga and the Jarbo Gap. And 
it took nine hours for a PG&E representative to get up there and find that several fuses had in fact blown. And, and now there was uh, trees uh, falling into the line and starting the fire. These were living trees, not dead trees. So it, it's this ongoing non-maintenance of their ancient decrepit equipment that um, caused all these fires. It's caused 100 deaths here. We take that very seriously. We feel like we are being treated as expendable. It seems that there is an acceptable kill rate and we don't accept it. And so part of what we've done in 350 it, in Butte County is actually get more involved with an even more critical crisis that happened because of the fires, and that is our, our homeless um, situation. We've got about 7,000 people who have been homeless since the campfires in our county. And um, we have all these non-representatives in our government who um, take money from the fossil fuel uh, corporations and um, have done nothing to, to prevent further fires. And so, of course, they keep happening. And the drilling is literally killing us. And so that's basically what I want to say. And thank you so much for having this and for having the North State represented too, because we do feel forgotten a lot of times. Thank you so much, Mary King. Thank you for your perspective. All right, I would like to open the floor now for some press questions. If members of the media have any questions, we do have a few minutes left. So if you could pop those questions in the chat, we will read those out. And I'll go ahead and give members of the media a few minutes to do that. Um, so I would also like to just go ahead and thank our panelists for painting a complete picture of not only the Dixie fire, but the landscape right now that California is in and the necessity for corporate accountability, for utility accountability, for phasing out fossil fuel drilling and infrastructure right now. We are seeing the undeniable effects of fossil fuel drilling and infrastructure right now with these wildfires that are not likely to end until we end our dependence on fossil fuels and center our communities in energy decisions. So if there are no questions from the press right now, I will go ahead and um, just facilitate a quick kind of wrap up discussion. Um, between oh, actually, our I do have a question here from Colby. Colby, I've allowed you to ask that question live. And so you just unmute yourself. Perfect, great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being available. Um, I have two questions that I would love to ask. Um, my first question is um, with regards to PG&E. Um, I know that there's been some recent like reporting by ABC10 that's really shown um, the the involvement, like the intimacy, like a PG&E, like with the governor's office and uh, kind of the captured nature of the CPUC that they're alleging. So I just kind of wanted to get a sense from y'all of kind of even with all of these like reforms that have been passed, you know, and various things, there still uh, doesn't seem to be much, much accountability uh, for PG&E from the governor's office, like and from this uh, state and from the CPUC. So I just wanted to get a sense from you of just um, whether whether you think um, the increased uh, enforcement process will actually occur, what the likelihood of that is, and kind of what what pressure y'all can put on um, like the state to try to bring about more accountability with pg &E. Hi, Colby. Thanks for the question. My name's Pete. Why would he? I work with the Reclaim Our Power and Utility Justice Campaign. Mary Rose had to step away to another engagement. Uh, thoughtful question and, and uh, right on point looking at, uh, so folks who haven't followed it as clearly as Colby was pointing to, pg &E goes into bankruptcy because of fires. Part of the deal of getting them out of bankruptcy is an increased oversight process that involves if they do bad enough stuff, we think they've already done bad enough stuff, but they hit a certain threshold and they should be, their business license should be revoked, um, which we think is a, 
a, a far too late but still good model to for holding corporations accountable and moving our energy system and our health and safety out of corporate control and into the control of uh, the people of California. So the Public Utilities Commission has been woefully slow and negligent and uh, turning a blind eye up until this point and even in this point about exercising the power that they have. And so we are loudly and vociferously saying they need to exercise the power of the uh, enhanced oversight process. They need to uh, which which says clearly, uh, uh, PG&E, we ho will hold you accountable. Every one of those commissioners voted unanimously and spoke uh, with emotion in their voice when they passed the bankruptcy plan a year ago. We will hold you accountable. This will never happen again. It's time to to change how PG&E uh, uh, operates. The governor even saying uh, PG&E no longer exists um, as we know it. So. Uh, so we are pushing hard on the Public Utilities Commission and know that they that they have the power. Mary Bell Batcher, the president, has the power to do this right now and uh, and give the public confidence that next year, in the next couple of months, that, uh, that this cannot be uh, the future of California. The PG&E's undergrounding plan for their power lines is another way to extend corporate control. And we've seen this in the fossil fuel extraction area as well. But the, the longer that corporations are in control of our energy system, our health and safety, the more people will die, the more lungs are, the more our lungs will burn, more our economies will shatter. And we need to step away from that and do so immediately. So thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for that. And um, um, if I may, I wanted to ask as well about um, just Governor Newsom, like more generally, like to any like, of the panelists, of course, um, you know, of course, if the recall like is uh, putting his kind of like traditional like supporters in kind of a bind, of course, because they would like to see more progressive policies from him, you know, setbacks, um, accelerated fracking ban, you know, like stronger pg e accountability, but, but, uh, but they would rather probably have Newsom than like a Republican. Um, so uh, I guess I just uh, would love to hear how your coalition is um, thinking about the recall and, you know, how to support him, whether to support him. But then after the recall, whether he is kept in office, whether um, the pressure like, will be ramped up then um, on Newsom um, um, if he does beat the recall effort. So is there, is there any one of our panelists who would like to take this one? Um, I know Alexandra Nagy from Food and Water Watch has, has a position on this too, so. Yeah, I think RL um, wanted to jump in. Sure. And to be clear, my, my group Climate Hawks Vote has endorsed Governor Newsom in this recall. Um, this recall is pointless, stupid, expensive, and potentially dangerous. I am confident that Governor Newsom is going to survive the recall and that he's going to feel that he has a mandate. Now, very recently, he's begun to um, deny fracking permits. And that is getting people more excited about voting for him. His promise to shut down fracking in California by 2024 and the indications that he is now carrying out that promise slowly. Um, we don't expect a ban on fracking immediately. Um, he's stated that he's gonna do this by 2024. However, we do expect him to begin to deny fracking permits as they come up. We're also really excited by his or by his order for California to um, basically speed up the transition from 2045 to 2035 and generally the climate steps that he's taking. So if he survives this recall, as I'm confident he will, um, with a mandate, as I'm sure he will claim, that mandate is to take climate action. Poll after poll after poll shows that climate is a top concern of Californians. And frankly, we're all scared. People who don't know anything about climate are scared by the wildfires. They're scared by the drought. Um, just they're turning off power from Lake Oroville. They're 
beginning to allocate water from the Colorado River. This is a scary time for California. Um, and I appreciate that Governor Newsom is in fact beginning to take bold steps to address the climate crisis. Does that help? Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Arl, and thank you, Colby, for the question. Um, we've got to wrap things up here. We've got just a few minutes left. So first of all, thank you to our panelists. Oh, and Alexandra, I see you as well have a hand up. So I'll go ahead and open up the floor for you for a moment or two. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that Last Chance Alliance being a, a broad coalition um, doesn't have a position on the recall. So even though RL um, with Climate Hawks vote, you know, is a member within our coalition, the coalition at large does not have a position. All right, thank you, Alex, for that clarification. So I wanna thank all of our panelists today for sharing your stories. And I wanted to thank the media for listening. Colby, thank you for your questions. There is no untangling the connection between fossil fuel extraction, a warming earth and the wildfires destroying towns like Greenville. Our only hope is to cut that connection, halt global warming and protect our frontline communities from climate disasters like the Dixie Fire. Governor Newsom has the opportunity of a lifetime to be a climate leader. And we applaud the steps he has taken to deny fracking permits, but we no longer have time for movement and slow drips. California's communities need Governor Newsom to phase out fossil fuel drilling right now. If we don't, disasters like the Dixie Fire will no longer become headline news. They will become daily news. Thank you all and please reach out. We will give you all um, a post press conference packet, members of the media, if you have any other questions, and we will give you contact information um, to get other follow-up interviews. So thank you all for attending today.